My name is Susanna Zarayski, and I'm, I'm the author of the book Language is Music. And when I was in Istanbul in November, I had the pleasure of meeting Aaron Myers from the Everyday Language Learning website. And he took me out to lunch, and we talked about language learning and what he's doing. And I wanted to interview him to put to so that more people could learn about what he's doing to help people learn languages. So, Aaron, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah. Um... Yeah, my wife and I and our two kids moved to Istanbul uh, four years ago, and uh, I, I was a, a teacher before we came. Uh, my wife is an ESL teacher. I was a high school teacher and an ESL teacher, and I think we thought we would probably uh, teach when we got here, but as we got into doing different things, we realized that there was just a lot of people struggling to learn languages, and so I started language coaching and writing uh yeah, helpful ideas, information, encouragement, tips, suggestions at the Everyday Language Learner blog. And I've been doing that, uh, yeah, for about a year now. So it's good to be with you. Very good. All right. So I would like to talk to you about the intricacies of learning Turkish for an English language learner, or sorry, English language speaker. So mm -hmm. when we first met uh, in November of, of 2011, you were telling me about the agglutinating, I think that was the word, Yeah. Uh, elements of Turkish. And then I read about that again in Michael Arard's book, Babel No More. And then yeah. just this weekend, a, an article came out in the New York Times about a teenage polyglot who's 16 years old and speaks like 10 languages or maybe more. And, and then he also mentioned this agglutinating thing about Turkish. And so please tell people what agglutinating means. <laughs> yeah. What do you do if you're an English language speaker and you're learning Turkish? Yeah. Um, yeah, so agglutinating. And, and I think, and I'm not entirely sure, but I think most languages are agglutinating to some degree. And I think when we talk about agglutinating and agglutinating languages, it's more we talk about it on a scale in the, the amount that they agglutinate. I don't know if that's how you talk about this or not. but um, I have no idea. And, and so uh, agglutination is when you're adding uh, a marker to a word in order to uh, give it a, a new meaning. So in English, we uh, change the third person. Um, so let's see. I walk, she walks, and we add that S, or we add ED to signal that it's past tense. Um, we add uh, I'm joy or I'm joyful. We add these sorts of things. Um, and in English, it's, it's, it's pretty minor. It's, it's usually one. Um, sometimes we'll have I'm ungrateful or unjoyful, but um, we and in English we only do it on the ends of the words with prefixes or suffix prefixes or suffixes. Is that right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't do a lot of it. Um, a little bit here and there. Um, and so English would be mildly agglutinating. When you get into a language like Turkish, it, it it's really agglutinates a lot, um, so that you could add four or five different, I mean, yeah, suffixes, uh, infixes in the middle of a word um, to change the meaning. And so, for example, in English, when we want to give something negation, we want to make it negative, we use the word not. Um, I'm not going. In Turkish, we put a uh, two letters, me or M I or M, I mean, uh, me, m, inside of the middle of the verb. So, um, for example, the, the verb for I am going is gidiorum, ben gidiorum. Gidiorum is, is uh, the conjugation of the word I, I'm going. Um, if you want to say I'm not going, you'd add that me right into the center of it, and so you'd have git miorum, git miorum, um, and you add it into the center of the word. Mm -hmm. Now, in English, we tend to use lots of helping verbs. Um, we we use um, what are they called? Modals like should, could, would. Um, if we want to express ability, we say I can ride the bike, and in Turkish that instead of adding another word, they add something into the word. So that uh, gidiorum, I am going, gidibilirm, gidibilir, 
get a belirum, I am, I can go. Now I've added the ability in into the center of that. Um, and and so one of the difficult things about Turkish is, is that you've got these levels of, of the n amounts of things. So you can add negation, you can add uh, plural, pluralization, you can add, I mean, all the things that English can add to words you do, but then there's just a lot more that you add to, um, you know, to your verbs specifically, um, so that it, it changes the, the verb and adds those elements so that you could have a, a verb with four or five different things going on inside of it. Um, in fact, I remember, I wish I had it here. I could never say it, but there's this uh, example word that you see a lot in kind of books about Turkish. And it's this, it's like, it's one verb, um, but it's, it's actually like two, almost like in a book, it would be two complete lines long. And it's, it's got like 18 different infixes. And while no one would ever speak that way, um, when you look at it, it's all grammatically correct and, and it has a meaning, um, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it's this wildly long, you know, it take it's like supercalifragilisticexpialidocious <laughs> times two, but it's, it's a sentence and it's, it's one word at the same time. Um, and, uh, so it's, yeah, that, that creates, you know, um, my wife and I both speak Spanish as well. Actually, I don't speak it right now. It's mm -hmm. hiding. Mm -hmm. it's, it's back there somewhere. It's hibernating. I haven't really, um, yeah, as we've been here, I just have kind of let it go. I know that it's back there and it's always interesting. I'm always surprised myself how the human mind can really hold on to things because, mm -hmm. you know, I'll listen to something in Spanish. I'll be like, wow, I understood, you know, 90% of that, um, though I could never say it right now. Mm -hmm. But I know that with, a couple of weeks, I'd be back on the back in the saddle, and um, though my Turkish is better than my Spanish ever was, but but it's interesting. Even now, if I pick were to pick up a Spanish newspaper and a Turkish newspaper, I I would say that I might have a better time or feel more comfortable with the Spanish reading it than the Turkish, depending on what it was writing about. In in large part because. You know, I, I can I can look at a sentence in Turkish at times, and and this is in writing mainly, mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll understand the meaning of every word in the sentence. But because of this agglutination, because of these these, you know, this all these changes to the verb, I get to it, and I'm like, I have to like stop and think about it, and 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 at times there'll be a one in there that I'm not familiar with, and I'll just be like, I I've just I like I. I know the gist of the sentence, but I feel like even now I could look at the same sentence written in Spanish and probably have maybe have a better chance of understanding it because it doesn't have all that agglutination and because Spanish really follows English grammar and structurally they're just so similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's and and that's the other thing with Turkish you've got. Um, You've got a lot of different forms of grammar that don't exist in English, um, especially compared to Spanish. You know, in Spanish, there's a few, there's some things, but in general, I, I felt like now I might, I never studied Spanish formally either, so I'm not completely mm -hmm. sure. But you know, in general, we we do the same things with the languages. We we put our ad adjectives on different sides of the the noun, um, but there aren't like completely new forms of of, of grammar forms that uh, that just don't exist in, in English the way there are in, in Turkish and the way they uh, do that. So so it's been it's been a fun language to learn. I, I really love Turkish. It's one of the great things about Turkish is it's really um, it's uh, it's almost like a manufactured language. There just aren't a lot of uh, what do you like in English? What do you call it? Uh, irregularities? Oh, right. Okay. Um, it's really rule bound. Um, you don't, you don't have these. Oh well, in this case, you do it differently. Uh, happening in Turkish a lot. Um, in that sense, that makes it. Yeah, there aren't a lot of surprises in that sense. Um, though sometimes I think you know, in even in English, it's like kids learn the idea of go and went really quickly. 
and part of it, I think, is because it is an irregular, an irregular thing. Part of it's because it's used so much, but um, sometimes those things stick out. I feel like, and it's like, oh, I'll remember this one now because it's it's an irregular verb or something. But um, Turkish doesn't really have that, so that makes it nice. Um, but uh, yeah, that that learning, you know. One is just all these the new structures, new word order, the verbs at the end. So it would be subject, object, verb, uh, as opposed to subject, verb, object. Um, but and then some of these new grammar structures. Um, some of them are really great, more efficient. Um, you know, I find myself wanting to say things in English that, you know, like in Turkish, you'd say is the going train instead of the train that is going. Mm -hmm. There's just a way to say the going train is, is the going train here kind of thing. <laughs> um, and every language has those things. You're just like, oh, that's great. I love the way that happens. Or just that word is more descriptive or mm -hmm. has a, just a, a, a more intense connection to the meaning of what's really the essence of the word. Um, and then there's things that you're just like, why do we do this? <laughs> you know, that you just struggle to get. But um, yeah, it's. What recommendations do you have for English speakers who want to learn Turkish? What are the things that you had to overcome in terms of pronunciation or, for example, mm -hmm. this agglutinating thing? How did you train yourself to agglutinate? Yeah. Um, well, I think with with sounds. Turkish is for coming from English. Turkish is fairly fairly easy. There's not um, they have like an the umlauted the the double dot above the o and the u o u mm -hmm. um, that is not in English. They have a a soft g which is kind of a spacer. Uh, it, it's yeah. It's I think Turks actually make a something in there the way they do their the structure of their mouth when they're making this, mm -hmm. but it's an easy one to just kind of give a pause and uh, yeah, it's not a, it's not a big thing. Um, so the sounds aren't really too difficult. And the other thing with Turkish is they, with the, it's really, they, they had like an Arabic script up until 1923. Mm -hmm. And then they went with the, uh, the Latin, Latin, Roman, the Latin yeah. alphabet. Um, like we have, um, and they just extremely scientific, like reading Turkish is a breeze, one sound, one letter, mm -hmm. um, you know, the SH sound in, uh, English sh. Um, I remember reading that in English, you can make the sh sound 14 different ways. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. Was, everybody in the world is struggling to learn English. And like, let's see, do I nation? Mm -hmm. uh, let's, how do we make that as and in Turkish it's just an S with a little tail on the bottom mm -hmm. so in that sense reading Turkish is extremely easy uh, to sound it out mm -hmm. um, uh, as far as the language goes you know uh, the other thing that Turkish has is it has if you've your you have different endings on your words depending on the, the verb so if you're going to something uh, you're You've got a, an ending on the noun that says you're going to it or from it or if you're at it. So there's endings on words as well that that change. And, and some of that's similar in English. When we want to say possession, we add apostrophe s. So there's that's happening in all languages. But uh, Turkish has a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit tougher in that a lot of the endings on nouns are dependent and change according to the verb. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's again it's real rule based. It's this verb always has these these endings, um, but I found you know, you, I found that the the number one thing that's helped me is just the more input I could get, um, the, the those things started to come naturally because it's just too much to try to memorize every ending and you know this verb gets this ending and this verb gets that ending and and it's not just the verb that's changing it's it's changing the word that it's talking about and and so my recommendation has always been uh listen as much as you possibly can um and i would say this is for every language mm -hmm. um, but for turkish particularly with the glutination i i just i you know it's like you can try to 
memorize how this works or try to figure it out. And it's there is you need to study and, and figure out, okay. But if you're listening a lot, you're reading a lot, you're writing and experimenting with it and getting feedback from native speakers. I found the more that I did that, the more those things kind of fell into place. And I mm -hmm. mean, for example, to get off the bus when I was here, you, there's a Musai Birriarde in a Belirmim. So at a suitable place, could I plead, can I get off the bus? Mm -hmm. um, and it's this in a Ibil. Ibil is in the middle of that in a Um And that was in there. And I memorized this phrase so that I could get off the, the bus mm -hmm. without knowing what it meant. Um, <laughs> because I needed to get off the bus. And so I was using the form. Uh -huh. And and I remember one day I was working with a I was working with a university student who's helped me learn the language, and I was going through some stuff and we were looking at it, and it just all of a sudden fell into place. Like I get it, mm -hmm. I and he never explained it to me. I'd never seen it in a grammar book, but because I'd been using it, because I'd been seeing it elsewhere, um, because we were, I was playing around with it and hearing it. And and my the scope of the language was slowly you know getting broader. Those it just fell into place, and it didn't. And and then it was like, you know, it was locked in, um, because it it came naturally, it came more intuitively. Um, and so I, I guess my thought is I, I want to use any and all means that are available to me to learn the language. Um, but I always want to I I liken it to the my relationship with my wife, I didn't, when I met my wife, I didn't give her a personality test and have her take a, <laughs> uh, you know, an IQ test to get to know her. I spent time with her, got to know her. Now, last year we got this book from a friend and it's, it's this book by Gary Chapman called the five love languages. Mm -hmm. And we were reading it together and it, it was really insightful. Like there were things that I intuitively knew about my wife, but reading about it in this book, it's like, it just all of a sudden, had these oh yeah now I get it and I think that's the way I like to approach languages I want to I want to build a relationship of time with the language first and then I want to go back and go to those grammar books and those um you know it, it, someone explaining it to me uh, those sorts of things and then it it's like ah it fills in the gaps and it can really help um and so that's kind of how I approach language uh, and then encourage people to approach it. Now, I also think everybody's different and some people are just, they need to know. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it's, it's really, I've got a friend here. He's, he's amazing. Like these British and in like a year he was speaking better than I was speaking after three years. He doesn't have two children, mm -hmm. but um, he's an engineer and he approached learning Turkish like an engineer. I mean, it was dissected. I'm going to read all the grammar and, you know, everything about this language. And then I'm going to build sentences according to those things. And that's what worked for him. And so I, I guess I try to stay away from this idea of there's one way and there's a silver bullet. And it's more of what's your learning style? What's your personality? What's your, um, what are your interests? Uh, what are the available resources that are available to you? And, and then try to help people build kind of the ideal maximized learning program for them. And uh, I do encourage everyone to just to learn a language. You need you need to hear it a lot and you need to hear it a lot over time. Mm -hmm. and, you know, you need input and you need time. Um, and I guess I, how you get that isn't as important as getting a lot of the language and uh, and so that's kind of my recommendation to people. Do what you love in it so that you get more of it. Um, and yeah, that's, yeah, there are things, you know, with Turkish, it's like having someone, another expat even explain a grammar structure to me helps speed the, the process because all of a sudden it's like, okay, I've got at least an idea of what's going on here now. But then I really wanted to experiment with it, write sentences with it, use it every way I thought I could try to use it and then get feedback and eliminate all the, the wrong answers. And, um, and in that way it was more of a discovery learning as opposed to a top down. I'm telling you, teaching mm -hmm. you how this works. You know, it's really, I'm really glad you're mentioning this about how you fall in love with the language. You find something you like about the language and you get, you 
kind of surrender yourself to it from what you're saying and and then you figure then in your case you, you learn the grammar and you're the British guy learned the grammar and then he created sentences so you're right there are different ways of doing it and I can give an example in my case that I learned Portuguese in a, not, in a very unsystematic way and it was mostly through input listening to a lot of Portuguese listening to music and figuring out on my own some of the differences between Spanish and Portuguese um, I did have a book actually but I was reading it before falling asleep so I mean I had, yeah. still haven't finished the grammar book and now I'm listening to a podcast called Tafalab, which explains the differences between Spanish and Portuguese and, and English. And last week I was with my Portuguese, uh, my Brazilian Portuguese uh, hiking group. And at one point I was really quiet. I was just listening. And somebody in the group said, are you okay? You haven't been talking. You're very, you know, you're just listening. And I said, oh, it's because yesterday I started listening to this podcast and I learned some grammar rules which I had kind of understood. I kind of figured them out on my own beforehand, but I had never had anybody explain the grammar to me. And I said, I'm just listening to you guys speak because I'm making sense of the grammar rule. And they were laughing because <laughs> they just thought I was in a bad mood or I was sad. <laughs> but really, I was listening to kind of make sense of what I, what I had heard. And uh, I'm also in that way that, you know, if I, I can't just learn grammar, I'd be really bored. And they're, Obviously, I learned a lot of Portuguese just by listening. So yeah. that's that's great. that's great. 